Was ist da? Buttons? Schreit über Tons? Very nice and like. No one likes a heckler. I love you. Shut up. Are you finished looking at GoPorn? You can never finish with that. So, before we get started on these two gentlemen, I can't speak English anymore because I've drunk too many beers, I will give three delicious beers for free to the first three people that stand up and say Cyber War really loudly. No one? That's one. Someone from there. Come on. Stand up. It's one word. There we go to one more from this side here. No one? No, you have to stand up, Pansy. I will walk to you with a five more! Thank you. So while, while I get beers, um, Josh Foreman and um, Jericho. Jericho. I have no idea what they do. I know he likes honey badges a lot, and he scares the pants out of me. Um, but they're going to talk about cyborg and stuff, so I will fetch beers for these people, and they will talk about cool stuff. Hello everyone, thanks for sticking around after the uh, meal. I know for the 5 to 10 percent of you that came over from the States, you're not used to a con running this late. <clears throat> so, cyber war. Now that we got it out of our system, uh, we understand it is a douchebag topic. And uh, that's why we picked it. We want to hopefully inject a little bit of sanity into it. And uh, we're going to do it hopefully over the next hour. The goal is for you to walk out of here thinking, you know, cyber war. People are missing the point, so we'll see. The art, by the way, through all of these slides, uh, the actual like pre-done images, uh, Mar, one of our, my friend and uh, artist that we use, she is available to do your slides as well. So, we, uh, we have bios, they don't mean a whole lot. There's one thing you need to take away from this. We are not experts not on cyber war or pretty much anything else. We just kind of look at a topic and say, the rest of the people seem to be missing it and we give our take on it. So at first I said, you know, well, yeah, sure. We can do a talk on uh, cyber war. And Josh is like, cyber war, what? You know, he didn't quite get it. One of our big problems is the word alone is what Josh calls a thought-terminating cliché. When you hear the word cyber war, what's the first thing you think? Oh, exactly. Bullshit. And largely it is, but it's not the fault of the word, it's the dumbasses who use it. So, three parts. We're going to do failed analogies, we're going to explain why the term has been abused, why it's wrong. Uh, we're going to talk about what most people agree on. We'll set the stage for, yeah, maybe a few people will disagree, but they don't count. And then a bulk of the presentation will be, what else is there about cyber war that many people haven't considered? Throughout the talk, if we are not clear, or if you find a mistake in something we say, go ahead and speak up. If you want to discuss a point at length, please wait until after the talk. Oh, yes, and real quick, just to give you a fair shot, uh, free beers to anyone who can tell us the number of times a squirrel, any squirrel, appears in the presentation. <laughs> Go. Any squirrel. <clears throat> okay, so you're all caught up, right? And by the way, we asked on Twitter before the talk and no one got it right. So you'll look like a rock star if you get it. Failed analogies. When you think about cyber war, you were largely influenced by the media. And what did they give us? They give us this kind of great picturesque, ooh, doom and gloom. I mean, read this. Chinese DDoS packets are blotting out the sun. You know, absolutely retarded. And of course there is a disconnect here. Because you have what the media gives us, and then when you think of war, what do you think about war? It's a little more graphic. It's something that we don't really care for. Yet, magically, we get ourselves into them all the time. How about the pundits? 
You'll notice the date on this. This is very recently. Digital WMDs. Yeah, so uh, that's what the pundits are using and in influencing us. Every time you read an article, even if you dismiss it, these kind of words are drilled into your head a little further. So that leads into the buzzword hype. What have we been dealing with? The electronic or cyber Pearl Harbor, cyber 9-11, cyber apocalypse. Yeah, if you guys were doing the drinking game, you'd be out cold by now. We have electronic Hiroshima, but that's not good enough. Then we had to have Cybershima. And then we had Cybergeddon and Cyberatomic Bomb. So again, where's the disconnect here? That's Hiroshima. When we talk about that word, that's what we should be invoking, not DDoS packets blotting out the sun. So along with the pundits, we also have experts. And there's a lot of history behind the word cyber war. This is not exhaustive, but I did spend some time trying to figure out where cyber war came from. The first occurrence I found was January of 92. Uh, I found another one in June 94. And later on, you can go back and read these. And by the way, if you download our slides, there is a metric shit ton of notes that go along with this. They give lots of additional references. We cite all of our sources. And up ahead on a couple of these slides, you'll be like, yeah, cite your source. Yeah, I got a Google spreadsheet for that. And it's big. So, June 94, and you'll notice that these quotes, there are very different uses of the word. So moving on, December 94, we have another weird one. September 95, that's when it really gets into more of the, the classic use of the word that we know. Information war, cyber war, net war. Uh, experts, a lot of history behind this, especially at RAND. RAND was basically the, the first company think tank, circle jerk group, whatever, that came out with papers about cyber war and they defined it. And uh, these two guys, you'll notice the, the top paper there, very bland, very level-headed, right? And then almost 20 years later, uh, Rand, two different guys, or one different guy there, wrote a new paper, and all of a sudden we see the atomic bomb again. So the interesting part about this is that Rand actually keeps a fairly level head through at least 50% of those papers. They're not bad. You know, they get a few things wrong, which I'll go into, but then even they have to go back to the rhetoric. So yeah, we have a lot of experts. When you think about how many books are written on cyber war, I'm pretty sure that's more than the time cyber war has occurred. Uh, like I said, so little actual cyber war, there's a lot of experts. Uh, if you go to LinkedIn, there's at least 14 cyber warfare officers. Interesting. Uh, and by the way, that's in the U.S. Uh, and I understand this talk is kind of U.S.-centric, and I apologize that, for that to the Europeans, but we are really good at fucking this up. So we should take the brunt of it. Uh, the main problem is many people aren't speculating. They're speaking definitively. Uh, that's one of the things hopefully we will avoid. We will be very clear that we've got ideas. They may be right. They may be wrong. Run with them. Uh, experts in reality. So this is Rand. Over 20 years of the think tank. Go ahead and read this one. Anyone see a problem there? Why is it stupid? Hack hackers have one zero day. Yeah, so in Rand's mind, they think that private hackers have a single zero day, maybe. And that was in 2009. Did they just not read the rest of the internet? Uh, lots of experts at conferences, and I know there's a bit of irony here. So, you know, you see cyber war talks, you know, left and right. And by the way, these are all the ones from DEF CON 18 only. One con. Yeah, and this con has two talks on cyber war and one training session that had cyber war in the title. Lots of news, uh, which I have recently dubbed as stupidity. Uh, people love quoting Sun Tzu, but they love to get these little buzz quotes and then just kind of throw it and say, oh, that's cyber war. 
You know, we'll, we'll kind of make that work. Uh, a couple of us wrote an article a while back where we showed that not only is it stupid, but we could shoehorn in quotes from Genghis Khan, Mark Twain, Hitler, Squirrel Proverbs, doesn't matter. You can take any buzz quote and make it fit your need. So there's lots of lay persons. If you, uh, if you read Twitter, look for the cyber war hashtag, and you'll make it about five minutes before you close that column out because of the amount of stupidity. <coughs> yeah, he's a little uh, deformed here. So the Pentagon, the US military, in 2009, uh, they had a paper called Defining and Deterring Cyber War, where they defined cyberspace they make very logical points regarding the definition of cyber war, but they never actually define the word itself. So it's like, hey, we know kind of the battlefield, we know kind of what's going to be involved, but no, we're not actually going to define what cyber war means. And yet two years later, uh, the Pentagon sets the stage and says, well, we are going to respond to acts of cyber war. But, hey, we're still not going to define it. So yeah. The Pentagon disconnect. If cyber war is actually war, why it doesn't actually trigger anything on our side? You know, we have the DEF CON system. Uh, when was the last time that changed? Not recently. And when was the last time it changed because of a cyber attack? Never. So again, the Pentagon's really missing the big picture here uh, because they don't know what they're doing, but they have to do something and they know it. So there's lots of reasons uh, behind cyber war. These are some of the headlines of news articles, uh, and you'll notice the amount of money being thrown at it. So there's an obvious motivation to not only talk about cyber war, but to say, we can launch it, we can defend against it, we can do whatever, as long as you give us millions and billions. And all of this leads into uh, the definition of war, which I started on and how we've been blurring the lines. We had the war, then we had a Cold War, and then the US got real brilliant and said, hey, we're gonna go to war, but we're not gonna call it war, we're gonna call it an operation. And then we decided we're gonna have a war on terrorism, war on drugs, you know, and the term war, yeah, the war on poverty, it's just getting really abstract. And then that leaves us with, hey, cyber war. Oh shit, China, yeah. So, cyber war and infrastructure, uh, that's the big thing recently. People say cyber war is all about attacking the infrastructure, and that's where the real damage is going to come in. So, looking at these, just the underlying parts, caused a nuclear meltdown, took down the financial system, constitute an act of war. What is it really, though? So, let's look at some of the infrastructure attacks real quick. And yes, all of these are referenced in detail in the notes. Which ones happened, and which ones were questionable? I see a whole lot of false, I see a lot of, eh, it might, might not be, and I see no true. So we keep going, and we finally get a couple trues and maybe a true. But these are the big acts of cyber war that people are referencing. Books are being written on these. You know, if that's the foundation for someone being an expert, when the details are sketchy at best, that's pretty sad. So moving from infrastructure, we go to satellite hacks, and hopefully you caught the talk earlier today on satellite, satellite hacking. Very cool talk. Uh, hopefully I'll talk to the guy who did that later. Um, he had probably some that I don't, and I probably have a few that he may not, we'll see. But satellite hacking, for all the joking, largely true. These are incidents that are kind of scary. Uh, the one that most notable is, I think it was Landsat 7 in 2008, experienced 12 minutes of outage. And you think, eh, no big deal. But the fun part is they said, wait a minute, after that happened, let's check our logs. Then they figured out, oh, it also happened in 2007, and they never even noticed it. So it puts a kind of weird spin on, you know, what is satellite hacking and does it matter? So let's do a quick threat comparison. If cyber war threat is partially or largely based on outages, why are we ignoring the more vicious, legitimate, historical threat? Cyber war has done what so far? Has it killed anyone? No. Has it melted any power plants? No. There's been outages due to faulty equipment that were attributed to cyber war, outages due to digging, and outages due to squirrels. Yes, innocent little squirrels. So I've got a theory. 
I think squirrels are a more serious, legitimate threat than cyber war, historically. And moving forward, there's a good chance they may still be for some time. And if you don't believe me, let's play a quick game here. Uh, which of these incidents were squirrel and which were cyber attack? So yeah, which one detonated a Hudson County, New Jersey woman's car? Which one took out a Yahoo data center? Uh, yeah. Any guesses to which one is a cyber attack? None. These are all squirrel-related events. Also not pictured here is the squirrel that set a pastor's home on fire, among other things. So yeah, they're little bitches. So, squirrels versus the U.S. power grid. Which states in the U.S. have had a power outage due to squirrels? All of them. Huh? Yes. And uh, yes, the Google spreadsheet I mentioned, I reference at least one incident for every state. Uh, so, how about squirrels versus U.S. communications? They're getting there. Now, take into account that this is not exhaustive research. This is me Googling for hours, nothing more. If you actually read some of the stats, they get pretty scary. Well, that was power, yeah. Lincoln, Nebraska, 1980, something like 170 power outages, some 24% squirrels. One state, one year. So how about the world? Most of the common belief set 
centers around what nation states should do in their definitions and responses. There is acknowledgement uh, in the RAND articles, and, and of all the things we read, and he read way more than I did, the RAND stuff set, tended to be the least sensational and the most grounded. Um, it, it acknowledges that some of the targets will extend beyond the military. So there can be collateral damage, civilian, private sector infrastructure. Uh, and an acknowledgement of infrastructure, excuse me, espionage. So this is the one that you saw a tweet a couple weeks ago where I said sometimes Wikipedia gets it so wrong. Um, I, I have a big issue with the word politically there, but in general there's an acknowledgement that uh, espionage is, is a tool in the tool belt for cyber. Um, domains is just the way that warfighters talk about um, you know, mastery of the sea, dominance of the air. Um, in general, this is the way that it's sliced. There's a lot of debate within the echo chamber of the, the defense industrial base and the military community that it was not its own unique domain. Um, uh, I heard one general, one four star say that cyber is the only domain we created and we kind of messed it up. Um, but in general, we, we'd like to kind of end some of that navel gazing and just say yes, in fact, it is a domain. So. Uh, domain and definitions of meet the necessity for mastery domains go all the way back to, to Rome, Athens, Sparta, etc. So this, this recognition that you needed to have coordinated effort and cross-boundary effort between your navy and your land troops. Uh, and Space Road pointed out to us um, that, that classic army line that you, you can you know, lob shells from a navy vessel onto land, but you can't ever occupy and control a territory without boots on the ground. So likewise, you need some sort of equivalent in cyber. Now, one of the big disconnects is we get wrapped up on that nomenclature, we forget that you don't wage a domain, you wage a war. And that war will be prosecuted across multiple domains as necessary. What are you left about? Right? Okay. Um, we've covered some of this. Okay. Now, a lot of people believe, erroneously, that cyber war is a U.S. warmongering thing. Um, maybe U.S. China, you know, people who've been paying attention to U.S. China and Russia. Uh, but these people, as far back as 2005, had declared capabilities and investment, these different countries, and, and many more since. These were the ones represented in 2005 in a, in a paper out of Dartmouth uh, in New Hampshire. And essentially, um, I didn't even know what that one that looks like the US flag is, but that's Malaysia. So if you have countries like Malaysia getting into this, this is not just a US-centric issue. Um, one more thing is the targets um, are going to be different than traditional warfare. Um, obviously, the tip of the iceberg is um, military targets, military bases, military assets. But some terms you might hear in the US are DIB, which is the Defense Industrial Base, DIB Plus, which are private sector supply chains that the Defense Industrial Base depends upon. But increasingly, especially with some of these uh, state-sponsored espionage campaigns, they're targeting the entire Fortune 500 and above. Um, by my count, based on my relationships, I found 89 of the Fortune 100 companies lost intellectual property to state-sponsored espionage in the last 18 months. So if I've counted that many, it's probably 100 of the Fortune 100 have lost that. So it's bled into the private sector more so than traditional warfare has. And that's pretty much commonly understood. Um, citizens are part of it as well, but I'm not going to dwell on that because I have a whole section on hearts and minds. Um, but we also have to start thinking on modern digital infrastructure. So while we depend on roads and water and power, we're becoming pretty dependent on things like Google, things like Twitter. I mean, you're not going to have riots in the streets if you shut off the internet. Oh wait, you do. Okay, so this is uh, again bleeding into our civilian lives a lot more. And uh, if, one of the things he, he found which is pretty interesting is um, private sector backdoors and, and vulnerabilities were, were the first one he found documented was in 1979. Yeah, real quick. Uh, so the U.S. Air Force, and there's a blog post on OSPDB about this, they decided to do a pen test against Maltics, if any of you remember or read about Maltics. And part of the pen test uh, apparently was not scoped very well or like we do today. And so they broke into Maltics and they got privileged access and then, oh, they created a back door and then, oh wait, it was on the machine for new builds. And then they said, hey, Maltics vendors, we planted a back door, here's where it is, here's the lines of code and the Maltics vendor people said, we don't get it, we still can't figure it out. And this went back and forth, and apparently at some point Multics said, screw it. So they started shipping new copies of Multics, which were one-off installs, but with a US government back door in them, because they were essentially lazy. And real quick, uh, the 47 published vendor backdoors, 
if you've been following the last 24 hours, is now 48 due to PHP, my admin, I think. Anyway. So a lot of people say, well, when's Cyber War going to come? And, and we're going to assert to you that Cyber War is already upon us. You just have to be paying attention. Um, based on largely agreed upon definitions of what's going on in those different aspects, it's been going on. It's just not what we expected, and it's not going to be loud or noisy. Um, part of this is, if you think about prior compromises of um, military secrets, uh, joint strike fighter planes that are being built in other countries based on designs from U um, US allies, etc. It's been happening, we just kind of ignore the, the proof points because the thoughts are remaining cliche. Um, and there's also certified pre-owned. There's tons of demonstrably proven um, manufacturing back doors and hardware-based Trojans and root kits in your supply chain. There's all sorts of military folks using certified um, foundry uh, manufacturing plants, which are much, much more expensive, but if they don't trust their vendor supply chain of the hardware, firmware, software, um, it's becoming a big problem. And this isn't going to be traditional warfare like you'd expect with big booms and things on CNN. It's more like a perpetual, constant, virtual war. Um, and it's been going on for quite some time. Um, in traditional warfare, you have a declaration of war or an act of war. We have no such thing. It's just been quietly, persistently, pervasively going on. In fact, many of the people uh, in the original anti-sec, depending on how long you've been in the industry, are really, really pissed that Anon and LSEC hijacked the term. Um, but the original anti-sec guys who were for full disclosure or, or no disclosure, they've been talking since day one about the inevitable conflict. The reason uh, you may need a battle chest of your O-days was for the inevitable conflict. So this is not a new thing. They were probably our earliest cyber warriors or cyber survivalists who had to keep their powder dry just in case. Um, and the bottom line is, uh, it's just not what you're looking for. Now this was a, a litmus test question mark. Um, this was of all the definitions the least ambiguous. A lot of people are deliberately vague or non-committal. Um, we found this to be a really interesting definition. Um, I'll just let you ogle at it for a moment. We underline the or, it's a little <laughs> prone to misinterpretation. Um, we found a few examples like the DDoS on Georgia uh, that was done in coordination with the tanks rolling into the nation state of Georgia. Um, also the Syrian air defense hack where basically cyber jamming took place to allow uh, a bombing strike to happen. Uh, there was a period uh, there that's well documented in the notes. But those didn't really cover it, so we think this notion, uh, this notion's missing, such as there's notions in traditional warfare of having dominance of a domain, means you are assuring access to you and your allies and preventing access to your adversaries. So this is the closest thing to a good one, but this is, uh, once again, an example in the Talon Manual of somebody being a little less thought terminating than their cliche. But let's transition to things that are much more personal because I happen to have a lot of respect for the fellow uh, hackers and researchers in the room. So we're gonna run some scenarios where these are things that I think traditional warfighters simply don't understand about this domain that I think we have unique expertise upon. Um, one of those is that the scales are very, very different. What do you think it costs to develop, design, build, and test and deploy F-22 fighter planes? Cost, right? Or if you talk about the nuclear club, these are the nations who have the capacity to do a Hiroshima-style uh, devastating attack. So the color coding there is how easy it is for that kill chain, right? So obtaining uranium, if you got the money, you can buy it. Enriching uranium, very, very hard. Developing a warhead hard. Testing one successfully without being noticed from satellites and radiation detection. Um, it's very hard to get a missile that can traverse an ICB type missile that can traverse long distances, but it's much easier to do a suitcase. And then you just need the willpower to actually do it. So we track every single step of these for developing countries to try to slow them down. In fact, it's argued Stuxnet was meant to slow down one of the steps for Iran. But let's switch to the cyber club. What's the barrier of entry to be very damaging in the cyber domain? Well, um, you can buy a netbook. Learn to hack, not super easy, unless you're a skitty. Find your first O-Day, not easy, maybe buy one. Um, develop a reliable exploit, much, much harder than finding the original bomb. And then again, the mustering the will to use it. But it's actually a lot simpler than that, isn't it? Because now, thanks to things like HD Moore's Law, I can buy a netbook, use Metasploit or Shodan or both, maybe even Loik, and then pointy, clicky, hit go. I'm in charge of my laser, right? Now, perhaps you don't think this is very honest. Um, 
I did a search for you because you were too lazy. This is Shodan, filtered on PLC with default passwords. Right now, every single one of these PLCs is exposed to the internet and extremely vulnerable. You don't even have to be skilled. I'm pretty sure there's an exploit in some open source framework to execute these. So what could you do? This isn't rhetoric. Ask yourself, based on your skills with your favorite tech tools, what do you think you could do right now with this available exposed information? This is just one. Back to the scales, um, it's automatable and repeatable. We were trying to do this entire deck without actually mentioning Stuxnet and Flame, we failed. But it, we were trying. And a lot of people focus on the fact that maybe, well, yeah, but that was pretty exotic malware. You know, I heard an estimate that it was $4 million budget. I actually think you should probably multiply that by 10, just a guess. But even if it's a $40 million R&D project for, for Stuxnet or Flame, how much do you think it costs to make an F-22 or a missile? or a bomb. Um, it's pretty darn expensive and you can't reuse those. We already know there's reuse because we saw plenty of reuse between Flame and Stuxnet. So it's much higher leverage. In fact, you can, one could imagine a toolkit where you just, I know it's very hard to defeat signature anywhere, so it's really, really hard. Um, but you can imagine a toolkit where you can make as many beautiful and unique snowflakes as you want. And yes, there'll be a tit for tat arms race and eventually they'll attack the toolkit. But essentially, it's, it's much, much easier to scale and highly leverage these software weapons. Um, there's also a question which we think could easily be this entire, an entire another talk over maybe many, many years, but there was uh, some things called in the question of should, is it patriotic for a, for a security company to deliberately not create signatures for their nation's cyber wars and cyber weapons? So we are not going to cover that, but we wanted to identify it. Now, the boundaries are much, much blurrier in cyber war. When you think of war, you think of sovereign nations and airspace and borders and territories. So these are uh, the way the world looks geopolitically. But there's also logical boundaries. This is how it looks from an intertubes perspective. And it somewhat conforms, but we quickly go from the logical boundaries to the illogical ones. I mean ideological ones, right? Um, and I love this XKCD cartoon, which basically shows uh, the nation states, so to speak, of social media platforms. But one of the things we found in our year and a half of researching and analyzing Anonymous, the rise of the chaotic actor, was these things are not about, these guys are post-national. A lot of that generation doesn't seem to have allegiance to any one nation. They're, they have allegiance to their digital tribes. So whether it's Anonymous, Jihadists, um, Occupy is a global movement, um, Freemasons, if you want to get you know old school, um, original gangsters. Um, it's essentially, there are ideological boundaries now which unite people a whole lot more than maybe fleeting notions of nationalism. Quite a few post-national thinkers in, in, in the, the B generation B. Um, and then there, we've had a long conversation about laws. We really know where to stick this. A lot of people have this belief that eventually the laws will catch up. But even in traditional warfare, there's really no legal precedent or legal definition of an act of war. It's basically mostly norms at the UN level or just assumptions about what counts and doesn't count. And it's more fragile treaties amongst allies and, uh, and other nation states and, and a lot of arguing and, and, and politicking at the, the, the UN level or the NATO level. Um, there's a lot of talk about laws. It's interesting. We just don't think it matters. Laws are effective against the lawful. They don't really matter to people who choose to ignore it or think they can get away with it. Um, so since we can't really define the cyber war, it's going to be much, much harder to, to legislate against it. So we think that's going to be a limited value, and that's just our opinion, but it's more speculative. Now let's talk about actors. Um, one of the, perhaps one of the largest blind spots we've seen in this, this whole discussion is the assumption that these will always be nation states. Right? So when you think about nation states, there was an interesting article that annoyed me um, about Anonymous because there was a public policy piece out of the U.S. saying that Anonymous is a non-state actor and they thought that that was a clever way to call them terrorists because Al-Qaeda is a non-state actor. But it was really an at face value assessment. When you have a state, a nation state, you have extra diplomatic level levers. You can do diplomacy, relationships, you can give them financial aid, uh, you can give them military aid and military training. Uh, you can cut these things, it's the carrot and the stick, you can provide them or retract them. There's all sorts of UN entanglement when you're at the nation state level. And you can do trade sanctions, economic sanctions, embargoes, taxes, tariffs. So there's all sorts of value levers you have when it's one nation state trying to influence or curb the activity of another nation state. 
Unfortunately, there's also non-state actors. And all of those nice value levers we just described go away when they're not a participating, identified nation state. They're borderless, nameless, economyless, and often, uh, in some cases, uh, leaderless. And that interesting border delivery, this is what got me interested in anonymous in the first place, and other uh, cyber war topics in the first place, is false flags. Partly because attribution is so impossible, there's so many people doing the work of a nation state, carrying the, the water, so to speak, but hiding in the smog of war or the fog of war um, under false banners like anonymous or pretending to be someone else. I mean, how many attacks from the Russian business network are traced back to servers in China? It was, oh, it's the Chinese. No. Um, anybody who does forensics knows how unreliable that is. So we have to consider the existence of non-state actors and the existence of the overlap. So pivoting to attribution, basically, we think it's impossible. I think that's the bottom line. I mean, attribution, if it's even close to possible, is really, really difficult. So the geolocation is meaningless. Forensics, as you saw from dual course presentation, can be fudged and obfuscated. Uh, even if you could do it, there's that age-old FBI problem of, okay, whose hands were on the keyboard at the time of that particular thing. And since he's such a sketchy individual who's way too into squirrels, um, you know, who's paying him to do that? What's his psychological state? Did he take his meds? Um, did his favorite gerbil get sick? You know, so we have to ask not just who's at the hands of the keyboard, but a lot more. So I think the idea of attribution is interesting. I think we should do soft attribution. A lot of my research on adversary profiling highly encourages soft attribution. But um, when you're going to retaliate or do counter strike or offense based on really unreliable attribution, it becomes much, much harder. So back to that kinetic response, there's all sorts of saber rattling that we will retaliate to a logical attack with a physical or kinetic response. And that's really, really damn hard to do if you don't actually know who attacked you. And if you can't reliably know who attacked you. And that's a, a particularly difficult problem for the area of cyber. All right, now we're getting some pretty pictures, right? I think we're getting some pretty pictures. All right, so the packet heard around the world. So, you know, the shot heard around the world historically, um, you know, was a real game changer. We're asking ourselves, there's been so many different cyber attacks. There have been demonstrable ones. Even though there were a lot of fake ones, we actually saw, you know, power plants go down or water, water treatment plants, et cetera. So what will actually rise to the level that we actually make my mother-in-law that concern? Um, and this is going to be pure speculation, but so far nothing has. Stuxnet hasn't, Flame hasn't, different uh, physical power grid things haven't. There have even been deaths due to some of these attacks, and they haven't risen to the level. So essentially, we think until something like a nuclear power plant melts down that, that strikes and rises to the level of consciousness and concern for my mother-in-law, um, this simply doesn't exist. All right, so quickly, um, there's this whole category of warfare, which is traditional, called non-conventional warfare. So war fighting is largely known, but there's a new school of thought that has a couple different pillars to it. PSYOPs, um, propaganda, um, psychological warfare, et cetera. So we're gonna talk briefly about hearts and minds and cupcakes. So why cupcakes? Um, there was uh, an MI6 attack. Um, on uh, some Al-Qaeda networks. Essentially, there was a server being used to, to publish a PDF of how to make improvised explosive devices and whatnot. Um, MI6 decided to play a trick, and they replaced the PDF with recipes for America's best cupcakes. And this was psychological in the effect that it was meant to demonstrate, A, we're watching you, B, we have ownership of your assets, C, it's a deterrent to would-be recruits because this was largely being used as a recruitment uh, document and website. So it was a deterrent to say, maybe you don't want to participate. So whether it's cute or not and effective or not long-term, um, these kind of operations are more to strike fear in the hearts of participants or, or would-be combatants. And this one caught my attention as well. This, this private citizen, Aaron Weisberg, um, essentially did trolling for the win. He was trolling the jihadist website so hard that this guy in retaliation or frustration actually revealed his IP address and whatnot, which ultimately led to his arrest. So trolling can be very patriotic if done right. <clears throat> but propaganda is not new. Here's an example of a crossover between psyops and propaganda. These leaflets were dropped on Allied forces during World War II. One aimed at the British and one aimed at the US uh, combatants. So I'm not sure you can read it from there. Um, but basically, for the British soldiers, you are fighting and dying far away from your country while the Yanks are putting up their tents in Merrill, England. They've got lots of money.
money and loads of time to chase after your women. Uh, the second one is probably reminding these very horny, um, very um, far from home soldiers um, that they're A, they're not with their, their American women and B, uh, enticing them. So these were attempts to hurt the morale of warfighters outside of their own theater. Um, there's lots more propaganda, uh, which isn't so much to, to do prop. This is, this is propaganda from your own uh, teams. And the first one is from World War II, and the second one is from Star Wars. And because he hates everything but squirrels, he made me take out the 40 different examples of uh, propaganda I had. But essentially, um, if you think about this, bits of careless talk pieced together, look how much actionable intelligence about our lives, our employers, and even our military. Uh, people are dripping out via Facebook, Twitter, Foursquare. I mean, I know exactly everything Michelle Quinier did today because of Foursquare. Right? Um, she just left the room, so she wanted to get that joke. So, you know, traditional propaganda poster was someone talked, but is the modern when someone tweeted. In fact, there's plenty of exercises uh, in traditional military ranks right now. In fact, there's an entire clone of Facebook just for military people uh, in the U.S. military so that they're getting the same benefits, but they're not leaking it out to the public. Um, then there's people in modern times copying um, traditional World War II propaganda. So Anonymous has pages and pages and pages and pages where they doctored up and photoshopped um, excellent traditional ones. Can you spot the page? Okay. Okay, but they're not just copying. Um, in fact, Topiary, who just pled guilty in uh, the UK, is was, was a master propagandist. I'm not sure if he made this, but. Um, the, the instinct to, you, to do hearts and minds campaign, to win the will of allies and to intimidate opponents is part of warfare. You might not recognize it as warfare, but this is becoming very prevalent. There are pages and pages and pages of some pretty interesting and original artwork uh, coming out of some of the protest movements like Occupy or Anonymous or Lulset. Uh, and whereas you might have seen war posters like this with B-52 bombers in the past, you're now seeing that the, the rising sun carries DDoS. Um, so it's interesting to see signs and you know, rumors of war, wars and rumors of wars, a sign and a feature of war is used in propaganda. Um, very quick little section here, but one thing about non-commercial warfare is the notion of false flags. I mentioned that earlier. Um, what's interesting to me is, although you know, every time it says that three-letter acronym that starts with an A and ends with a T, God kills several kittens, so I don't use it, but um, state-sponsored adversaries um, love, love, uh, the fact that Anonymous is nameless and faceless and has no leadership. Um, it's created a wonderfully beautiful scapegoat and false flag. Uh, the, the, the guy I'm quoting here was in the Beltway uh, in a pretty senior position, but he said Anonymous is God's gift to China. But what he's failing to see is it's also God's gift to the Russian business network, to the cartels, to anyone who wants to be able to hide in that smog. Um, one of the things I do separately, and this is just a screenshot from it, is I've been trying to do adversary-centric risk management, both for prioritization, but also for spotting false flags <laughs> during actual attacks. And an interesting thing is if you map who's attacking, why they're attacking, the impacts they have, and the assets they tend to go after, you can tell when it's not really the actor it claims to be. Here's an example. Uh, activists, which I think is a silly phrase, they tend to be ideologically or politically motivated. They tend to affect the reputation or personal damage of something, maybe the availability, and they don't go after much beyond websites. So what's interesting is when you see someone saying, uh, we are legion in their text file in the attack, but then there's a bunch of fraud happening. It's basically the Russians pretending to be anonymous or low set to distract you while you're restoring services, and they're buying time for money mules to, to actually walk off with real kinetic money. So false flags are, 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 are very real, and it's getting much harder to spot. <coughs> so another aspect that you tend to think of in non-traditional, non-conventional warfare is the notion of terrorism. In the US, our, our most um, potent example is um, how a, a very, very small group of people could do very large damage physically to life, but also to the way in which uh, causing subsequent wars or infringement on rights and surveillance, et cetera. But you know, interestingly, you go fast forward and on September 11th, several years later, I'm sitting in a hotel room in San Francisco, and essentially you saw over 20 countries rioting the US and uh, European embassies after a YouTube video. In what universe can a YouTube video or any form of social media ignite protests? There's all sorts of suspicious stuff here, like 
RPG grenade launchers fired in, killing a U.S. ambassador. Um, just they just happen to be ready at the exact time of the video, etc. There's all sorts of conspiracy theories on this, and I'm not trying to promulgate them, but it really got me thinking: How repeatable is this? Could I basically get a protest on demand? Could I cause a kinetic? on the ground warfare between two nations simply by using meme hacking and social engineering. I think there's quite a few excellent social engineers in this community, probably even in this room. In fact, there was a red team class that was pretty epic just two days ago. So what could you do with social media in the hands of people who are brand new to the internet, brand new to social media, and already looking for a fight? So let's get very, very personal now for the, the last section here, which is, um, I'm kind of excited about this game coming out, I guess like next week. but. Um, one of the reasons I picked this is, you know, we're kind of a culture who grew up around video games. Um, but also, this particular one takes place during the American Revolutionary War, which emulates and, and carries through some of the things that I think this room could do. So for the next remaining slides, I want you not to think about this outside of yourself, but what could you, as a citizen soldier or cyber warrior, do? What guerrilla tactics could you use within your skill set uh, to be impactful in any sort of uh, current or upcoming cyber conflict. So, citizen soldiers, um, whether these are formal or informal militias, um, that's a US term, but uh, whether they're rogue solo actors, we're trying not to use um, any one solo actor, but they're individual solo actors getting a lot of press, um, doing things as private citizens that potentially affect international events. Um, whether it's some sort of Blackwater or Cyber Blackwater, um, these become interesting. Right now, if someone takes down jihadist websites, they may be interfering with uh, you know, international intelligence operations that were monitoring those. Um, if we have a few actors, it's interesting, potentially risky. If you have several actors, you start having blue on blue or operational collisions, and things can get pretty hairy pretty quickly. So I'm gonna mention letters of mark. Now when you think of militia, you might think of like, rednecks in the South, or you might think of war reenactment folks, or you might think of people who fancy themselves warriors, and although there's a lot of talent here, often the militias are the least fit to fight. They're just kind of interested in no one stopping them. We especially like the guy on the left there, or the two in, two in from the left. Now, a feature of non-conventional warfare is often called guerrilla warfare, pardon the pun, this is a great boot shirt that I have to buy. Um, but asymmetric warfare is when uh, or guerrilla warfare is when few people do heavy damage because they break the rules. I, I think this demographic is pretty well known for coloring outside the lines and breaking the rules. So with a small group of people, you can do larger things. Now, one of the best books on this subject matter, I'm surprised very, very few people in the InfoSec community have read this, is uh, The Starfish and the Spider, which is about the differences between decentralized or leaderless organizations like a starfish and centralized or hierarchical organizations like a spider. Basically, the shorthand is if you cut a spider in half, you have a dead spider. If you cut a starfish in half, you eventually have two starfish. So it's wildly different strategies for identifying when to use a starfish and how to fight a starfish. And most people's instincts are incorrect. Um, Jericho would like to replace the word spider with the starfish and the cow because it's a much clearer metaphor. But let's talk about these citizen soldiers, right? I was reading in the LA Times, and I recognize this guy in the picture who I will not name at the moment, but these are civilian hacktivists fighting terrorists online. This guy's doing it from his home office in the Northeast. Um, there's another group popping up. A lot of them I know about clandestinely, some of them more overtly, but this other group here is just one of several where people in our industry, white hats and gray hats, are basically convinced that the, <laughs> The powers that be are not doing a good enough job and they need to do their patriotic duty and start surveilling on foreign enemies or information gathering or collecting. And while this might feel patriotic, it's, it, it's rife with challenges and difficulties. And in some of these cases, while they're taking down child pornography sites or where they're trying to map jihadist networks, they're actually interfering with international um, operations. Um, and the more they do it, the, the more collisions we're gonna have. So we're not gonna get into this long soliloquy about who watches the watchers, the watchmen, but there's a lot of moral ambiguity here and there's a lot of chance for mistakes. And we're not necessarily, we wanna make it very clear, we're not calling for a watch group to watch the watchers, um, but we're acknowledging the fact that things can get very, very slippery very, very quickly. In fact, one of the big concerns of the people who've, who've admitted to me that they're joining these organizations 
or contemplating it is that they're very concerned that their fellow teammates and vigilantes do not share their same value sets and that they're going to find out very, very quickly um, how dangerous a game they're playing. So we dug deep and we thought about this, and there's actually historical precedence for this. If you understand pirates, um, pirates got so bad that um, basically the, the different governments in England and Europe and the US decided to anoint through this policy called Letters of Mark under this banner called the Freedom of the Seas, they basically created state-sanctioned anti-pirates. So perhaps the most famous one is depicted there, Sir Francis Drake, but essentially to fight piracy that was outside the reach and capabilities of the traditional armies and navies, uh, they anointed people to, within certain boundaries, you could le legally and lawfully fight pirates and keep a, a certain ratio of the booty. So we find that it to be potentially interesting to unleash the talent of the hacker community uh, in some more structured way like they'd have in the past with letters of mark. Um, we also thought about if we were to form, so if you were to grab a few of your friends or a few of your fellow podcasters or a few of your um, hacker friends to try to form one of these citizen soldier brigades, not encouraging it, in fact, it may be a horribly bad idea, but if you were to do so, how would we architect and blueprint these? Because we weren't brought up in the military. Many of us were brought up on Zork or MMORPGs or World of Warcraft. So I was trying to say that perhaps this new generation might understand the notion of guilds or the notion of differentiation and specialization or pooled resources. And Jericho pointed out, um, potentially from experience, that there are all sorts of blueprints predating World of Warcraft, things like the old hacker groups. You know, back when you both were apprenticed and learned your skill and learned your trade or code of conduct and your ethic from the group like, you know, TNO or uh, Greeny World, uh, what was it, Green World Domination? So these are just a few, but we actually have precedent for how groups of people who might not even have met in meat space can organize and build trust and do things uh, effectively and clandestinely. Um, we also suggest, and this was the, the crossover and parallel from the year and a half we spent on the Building a Better Anonymous series, when we were suggesting on how to build a better anonymous, one of the things we said was they, they lack a common belief set and common value set. And one of the reasons they can only achieve so much is um, if you believe something, write it down. So part five of the series accidentally turns out to be a pretty darn good blueprint for any group that wants to form the new private citizen intelligence gathering or work to take down child porn or whatnot. So the idea was if you can first ratify amongst your cohorts what your, your first beliefs were, your first principles, your code of conduct, your strategies, your exit conditions, then you knew where the clean and bright lines were. So anyone considering this or actually entering into one of these, we'd encourage them to consider some of the things we pose to anonymous. Now perhaps you don't want to be a combatant. Um, we did pose in the abstract that you can either be a, a warrior, um, a uh, piece of collateral damage or a conscientious objector. So survivalism may be your option. Maybe you just want to avoid things. But the interesting thing about survivalism is since this is bled outside the, round, the realms of if I don't work for the military, they'll leave me alone. We already talked about this affecting power rights. We talked about this affecting your economic conditions in your, in your country. We talked about this um, affecting your Google or your power or your intertubes. So quite a few survivalists come up to me at conferences now and their first question is how many rounds of ammo do you have? Now whether this is a question for the zombie apocalypse, I'll let you decide, but um, the instinct behind that is many, many security professionals have what's called a bug out bag. It's a backpack packed with supplies and dried goods and non-perishables and, and perhaps a machete for the zombie apocalypse. But we started asking ourselves, what is your survivalist strategy to cope with being off the grid or without power if you're in a cold part of the world? Um, do you have redundant alternative communication <coughs> technologies? We saw in satellite hiking, you can actually piggyback on um, satellite technology to communicate. A lot of my friends have ham radios or they're getting their ham radio licenses. So we're not saying the sky is falling and Armageddon is coming tomorrow, but we are increasingly becoming dependent upon digital infrastructure and it's increasingly at risk of not being worthy of that dependence. So we think there, there could easily be an entire talk on how to prepare your cyber bug out bag, so to speak, and what things might go into that. I have two little girls, I'm contemplating at what age I decide to teach them how to hack. Um, it's becoming a, critical, a critically necessary skill, hardware hacking, software hacking, social engineering. Um, but what would you do? Because at this point, since we don't believe cyber war is coming, we believe it's upon us, you essentially have a choice of stepping up 
um, or, or having an exit plan um, because we just don't think duck and cover is really an option. So I'm shocked and surprised to say this. Hopefully we made you think even though we went through a douchey topic, but we are on target for time. And we want to thank a, a very large list of people who worked on a very uncomfortable topic for a very long time uh, with us. Many of them are named here, some of them refuse to be named, but um, hopefully we're, we're, we're going to push past the thoughts are being cliche and we're actually going to start getting people talking about not what it isn't or what it shouldn't be, but what it is and what role you're going to play. I think at this point, this particular community is better poised and skilled than any to find themselves in the fray. And you're either going to be reacting or you're going to be prepared. And I have a hunch that Ed Scotus' talk might talk about being prepared for that. So with that, we have some beer. We have, what, two minutes for questions? First, first up, did anyone get the number of squirrels? Wrong. Did you got the no 18. I'm sorry, what was that? Beers. 20. 20. Huh? Please count. No. no. In the presentation. Who said 20? In the picture there were two, yes. And, well, yeah, the one with the squirrel going across the power line, and then the other one that's common to miss is the uh, nuclear explosion at Squirrel McGettin. There was a squirrel in there. People missed that one. Huh? You, you can go through it. Trust me, we did several times. The first time I counted, I think, 20, and then I was like, no, no, there's 18. He's like, no, 19. Yep. Yeah. It took as many times. He created half of them, and he missed two of them. So, so any uh, questions about the topic? Anybody, please. You don't know how painful this topic was to research and talk about it. I'm not sure that I really have a question, but I just wanted to point out, because you mentioned um, uh, the ability of sparking uh, a riot at, at will. And I just want um, that reminded me of, um, of uh, Occup the Occupy movement. How, um, you know, I guess you know, a lot of people will agree with the Occupy movement, but you know, it also shows that you could start a movement that you don't agree with. I mean, someone could start a movement that you don't agree with. And things like that, you know, it used to be that something like that would take place in one part of the world. Now that can spread to other parts of the world as it has, um, and also this transition of we don't have to rely on conventional media. A lot of the media at first ignored uh, what was going on, and uh, social media and groups like Anonymous kind of you know made it out there and said, you know, if we report on it, people will you know notice it. Um, and uh, yeah, I just think that's. Uh, Another example that you can throw up there just to show that it's not an isolated incident and that these things can, uh, you know, take place. Yeah, I mean, we should point out that some of these slides, an individual slide, we, we had a, an hour or two of conversation debate on that could easily be an entire deck on their own. So there's a lot of room for creativity in that particular one slide. Um, what would you say these uh, so-called cyber warriors are doing in terms of uh, intelligence services and collection of intelli um, electronic intelligence? Are real you, real you know, quick, qualify cyber warriors. Uh, people that think they want to attack another state. So we're talking civilian actors? Possibly. But you know, you have uh, collection agencies like NSA, GCHQ, and the uh, okay. BND in Germany. For I, I think that turns it into two very different questions. But you know, surely they're going to be targeting some of these organizations with um, what you would call uh, noisy data to make uh, to make them lose track of uh, the real targets. Right. But do, do you think that's a realistic scenario? Absolutely. And like Josh said, so if I decide, hey, I'm going to go after uh, jihadist websites and I start to take them down, am I also interfering with uh, the NSA, CIA, whoever that's been monitoring it and getting good leads in the real world, and me taking it down actually burns one of their greatest assets. So yeah, it's not just a noise problem, you actually can turn that into a kinetic loss. My DDoS attack just you know, made them miss out on more leads, tracking down real world bad guys or whatever. And so that's, that's a single quick example that we know as a fact has happened. 
Now, we didn't have a lot of time to get into it, but right now, without something like letters of mark, which at least gives some rough boundaries and bright lines of what a civilian can and can't do, um, having one or two people mapping jihadist websites is an inconvenience. Having 10 or 50 of them would be a nightmare. Sure. OK, thanks. We have time for one more before we get the next speaker up. And then we'll be outside if anyone else wants to move to the discussions or hit Josh yeah, in the yeah. face, either one. And thumbs up, thumbs down. Two thumbs up. It's late and I'm tired and I don't know how well formed this is going to come out. Um, Preach on, brother. So I'm going to insult everybody in the room and say that probably most people in this industry don't hail from smack dab in the bell curve in one way or another. You tend to find um, certain traits that aren't, well, okay, I think I've insulted everybody. If you take like the million monkeys with the million typewriters thing, I know I'm almost there. Think about somebody like Alan Turing. How many conscripts would it take to be the equivalent of one Alan Turing? And then think about how the kind of industrial defense complex works and the cultural divide between that and the, the type of mind I mean, there's a, there's a cultural gap there. When I see the Defense Department firing up these cyber commands and things like that, I'm just, it doesn't make sense. How are you? Well, it makes sense on some levels, financially, logically, politically, or whatever. But historically, uh, especially with the cyber commands spinning up, no, they don't have any precedent. You know, in some cases, it's interesting, in the US, one of the cyber commands dates back to, I want to say it was 1955, 58 or something. I read this and I was like, that had to be a typo. And it actually went, a couple of them went into the 90s, and then they got decommissioned. Right as the internet started to ramp up, they decommissioned them after 40 years. And it's like, what the hell are you smoking? You know, and then all of a sudden, uh, 15 years later, it's like, hey, we need a cyber war command. All right, and let's also close with a couple of facts. Um, there's a lot of talent in the private sector in this community that is lacking in traditional war organizations. Fact number two is I know of two dozen people who have already admitted to me they're forming or already in one of these or, uh, citizen soldier organizations and they don't have a plan. They don't have exit strategies. They don't have first principles or code of conduct. So we acknowledge it's happening. And, and the third is, um, you know, you're either going to have a plan or you're going to be um, reacting. And what we're hoping to do is pushing past this thought pyramid and cliche and hopefully not ruining our reputations at all or any more than they already were. Um, is to at least plant the seed that it's time to push past the, the groaning and eye rolling and actually start deciding what role you're going to play and what a responsible citizen would look like here. Because they're going to come at you. They're going to ask you for help or you're going to do it on your own, but you're, you're going to be involved. Just like we tell companies, it's not when you get hacked, or it's not if you get hacked, it's when you get hacked. Same with us. You know, we're looking at when, not if. All right, with that, um, I'm going to drink some more beer because that was... I feel like I need a shower after saying cyber that many times. Um, I thank you for letting us do this, and I, I thank you. Very Great talk. Yes. No? So we've got one more speaker up, Fernando. I'm not going to even try to put your surname because I'm African. Butcher. IPv6 security. 